Okay, I guess we can start. And the last uh, three lectures will be slightly different in, in style from the lectures which we had before because in physics, normally we concentrate on a single physical well posed problem and then we try to solve it. In astronomy, we usually have a different situation. We have an object and then we have to use all our knowledge of physics to understand it. So during the previous lectures, we uh, used mostly this physically motivated approach to to help you to, to, to gain some understanding. Now, during the last three lectures, we will concentrate on specific types of objects and then we will check what can be understood, what's not understood. So uh, today uh, I will talk about accretion onto main sequence stars and uh, uh, white dwarfs. Uh, next week there will be uh, a lecture on accretion in X-ray binaries of basically uh, neutron stars and, and the galactic black holes. Then there will be a gap of two weeks because first you will have a lecture of Aneta Shimikinovska on the same day. So there is no, no reason to have two lectures. And then I'm on vacations, which I planned because I didn't know that Aneta is coming. So the last lecture will be on uh, February, I think, 11. And it will be about AGM. So this will, will uh, close the lecture sequence as, as uh, planned. I will start with uh, some historical comments because most of the of the time when we did theory, we were talking about accretion disks. They are really very, very important in the accretion process. So it's an interesting uh, question uh, how accretion disks were uh, discovered observationally. And it's not really simple to trace. I tried, but I, I, I couldn't. But for, uh, fortunately, I at some point I found a radio of this guy, how to pronounce him, I have no idea. Kaichuk. I don't know the nationality actually. He wrote a, a conference paper about the real beginning of, of the knowledge of accretion desks. And the, the progress was as, as usually kind of complicated. So the, as the beginning date, we can consider 1934, many years ago. And then the, 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 the guy, uh, Arthur Bambridge Weiss, is, was observing some eclipsing binaries uh, using leak telescope, three meter telescope. He studied actually algal binaries. And those algal binaries uh, contain two uh, stars. They are not compact stars, just normal uh, stars. And they, they show uh, eclipses. One of the stars is, is brighter, so when you get uh, spectra, and he was doing spectroscopy, you see mostly one of the stars. So he observed the spectra uh, during the eclipse of the brighter star. So then he could see the fainter uh, star. Here, this is a copy from, from Wikipedia. And this, you see that if those two stars go around, then if the brighter star is, is hidden, then this, uh, the depth of the, of the eclipse is, is deep, the secondary is, is less deep. 
So he observed several uh, sources, but he had an impression that for, for one of the stars, which he finally did not include in publication, he was getting some interesting uh, results, but those results were not really published in the paper. He only made a footnote about those results. This is his original paper. In this footnote, he, he noticed that uh, he sees some emission lines and then those emission lines kind of change during the eclipse. It's a lot of things to, 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 to read, but it was not really conclusive. Still, he suggested that this may be very, very important and then the star should be uh, observed uh, much more frequently. This is this uh, RW Tau uh, star, uh, particularly during the deep uh, eclipse. Uh, this paper, as you see, was not very popular so far. It was only cited seven <coughs> times. So if you make a breakthrough discovery, you shouldn't do it too early, right? Because then your effort is kind of wasted. Right time is absolutely uh, necessary. Uh, however, uh, this was not totally unnoticed. And a few years later, another big guy uh, uh, collected more spectra using the same uh, telescope, Lick 3 meter telescope. And he noticed that uh, a clear pattern that he see uh, uh, emission lines, but during the eclipse, before the eclipse, he see uh, emission lines uh, redshifted, then they disappear, and then they reappear as blue shift. So we can imagine it like this, that if we have a, a ring of material, then before the eclipse, we see everything, but then uh, this, uh, the emission is, is too bright, but if the star moves and hides part, then we see emission lines only from that part. And later after the eclipse, only from, from that part. So Joey in 42, he already proposed an interpretation because his data was, was clear enough to, to propose that actually we have this kind of, of ring around one of the two stars. And that, that paper was more cited 57 times. And soon after, uh, in similar algal uh, type variables, uh, the same behavior was uh, noticed by, by other people. It still didn't have physical explanation why those emission lines and why this, this ring forms there, but not quite soon after Crawford in 1955, he was the first to, to propose the, the physical understanding because he was already, uh, uh, he had a lot of observational material from those guys and he was theoretically motivated. And he started to think about Roche lobe overflow because he knew that those stars are large and they are really close binaries. So this might be an issue. And uh, he showed that indeed the, 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 the eclipsing time, the mass estimate, everything supports the view that one of the two stars <coughs> feels the Roche law, we were talking about it. And then you have uh, uh, an accretion through the inner Lagrange points, and then you can uh, form a kind of, of messy material around the secondary star. And this, uh, was important not only to explain the, 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 the appearance of an accretion disk around the more compact uh, companion, but more, more importantly, this explained the, the so-called algal paradox, 
for many years, people were puzzled why uh, the less massive of the two stars seem to be more evolved, judging from the spectral type. Normally in the main sequence uh, stars, the, the, the higher the mass, the faster the evolution. So massive stars evolve very fast. Stars, low mass stars like our sun, it's pretty old, but it still didn't evolve much. It uh, has now four and a half billion of years and it, it has another four billion of years to, 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 to live. So the, and additionally, the, there were problems that the, the masses and radii did not quite coincide although they were well estimated from eclipses. So the mass uh, uh, exchange solved this problem because then initially this star was more massive and then it evolved faster, but then it started to lose the mass and the mass ratio changed. So now this component has lower mass and this component has higher mass and in addition because of the mass exchange, this is not really in thermal equilibrium. So the star is, is significantly expanded in comparison to expected radius for its mass. So this was just a historical introduction and now uh, we will start with a systematic, more systematic, although not, not complete survey of uh, different aspects, mostly concentrating on those systems which have accretion disks, because there the theory is most uh, developed and, and uh, needed. So we will start with a uh, pre-main sequence. Uh, stars. Uh, just a question before. So why, ah, can't, why can't the mass transfer? So, ah. yes. so after the first mass transfer, can it So this is the, the first mass transfer. Yeah, can it happen that there is a second mass transfer from the second one to the first one? I mean, is there a time difference which Yes, it can can be reversed, but then you will create on, 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 on this way a, a cataclysmic variable or something like okay. that. So it will be a different stage, yes. I do not talk here much about the global evolution. Okay. So the, I, I mentioned, I think already, that in the case of uh, massive stars, we do not observe this evolution because it's, it's too fast, it's messy, and we do not see anything. On the other hand, in, in, in case of uh, low mass uh, stars, like uh, two, three solar masses and, and below, uh, we can observe the, 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 the process quite, quite well. The, the process takes place in uh, some nebulae where there is uh, a lot of, of dense molecular material and then uh, new uh, stars uh, form there. <coughs> and we see them on Electron crustal diagram before they reach the main sequence. So the main sequence here is this one, and the values here are masses. So here, then up to five is notified, but then the evolution is very fast, and we do not really well observe this. Those are theoretical tracks, you know. So here you have the effective temperature in case you don't know what is this diagram or the spectral uh, type traditionally. And here you have the luminosity. So stars start here and those are evolutionary tracks. They go down along this uh, Hayashi uh, track 
because they they contract they do not change that much the luminosity but certainly they do change the temperature they become hotter so the radiation of those stars uh, is uh, powered first by contraction of the star and also mostly on this track uh, by lithium burning so they already start burning uh, but it's not hydrogen burning and the amount of lithium is, is uh, small. So this uh, part of evolution takes, uh, let's say, a few million years. There are some times here notified. Of course, when the star finally contracts enough to start burning hydrogen, then its life extends to to, to billion of, of, of years and it sits uh, steady uh, steadily <clears throat> on the main sequence but this this stage is very interesting <coughs> excuse me i still have problems with the throat <clears throat> this stage is interesting interesting because at the same time when the star forms oops, uh, also the planetary system forms so people studying uh, planet formation they are very very interested in this stage and we can do this study both uh, theoretically and observationally so observationally now we actually even see some kind of protoplanetary disks this is a hubble space telescope a photo of one of the stars in, in orion nebula but those disks are not quite like those disks which we discussed of course, the, the simplest approach is to, to say that, uh, fine, we have a Keplerian disk. Uh, but even if we cannot resolve those disks, we have spectra. And having the spectra, we can put some constraints on those disk properties. So those are exemplary spectra of uh, three such remain sequence stars. Here is the wavelength, and here is nu f nu or lambda f lambda. So I usually used log nu here, you have log lambda, so you have to reverse things a little. And what you see is here is a black body emission from the central star. And, that at, and then at longer wavelengths, which means far infrared, because this is the optical, no, also partially infrared. At much longer wavelengths, you have an extra emission. Here the same, the central star, extra emission, the central star, extra emission. But it does not quite look like the slope is okay for a Keplerian stationary disk. So people model it assuming that the temperature in the disk is has a power low shape and then the, the, the flux also has a power low form and the index requested by the data was minus half while in the standard disk you would expect minus uh, 0.75 so that immediately points that uh, the disk is not stationary. The disk is additionally irradiated. Also, the mass of the disk is quite large. This is not like in typical uh, systems uh, with uh, one solar mass central body. In AGN, we also have problems with the mass of the disk, but normally in the uh, accretion disks around one solar mass star, we don't have such, such problems. Additionally, what you see here 
the disk emits in far infrared, right? So they are also very, very cold, which causes problems in, in opacities. So on one hand, it's good because we have now for those disks, we have more observational information than we have for many other disks. Here, those are not uh, scientists, uh, you know, the, those are not artists' uh, views. Those are really maps of the disk obtained with uh, uh, here are this uh, instrument. So this is, and previously also ALMA in, in the millimeter band uh, mapped those disks. So you see how actually this disk looks like those images are in, in J or, or H uh, band. So you see, this is not a nice Keplerian disk like uh, we would like to have but it consists of, of rings. Sometimes you see some form of spiral waves. Those rings are important because those rings are usually signature that there is a, a planet or a companion forming there. Because if you have a, a, a massive body in, inside a Keplerian disk, it will interact uh, with the remaining gas and it will open a gap. So that illustrates immediately that physically those types of accretion disks are, in my opinion, the most complicated ones. And this was this is the reason why we did not discuss those disks before. They are far too complicated for a simple lecture, and there is a lot of physics, a lot of physics which is not quite well. Uh, understood. So I tried to list all the problems which we have with those disks. First, self-gravity. Indeed, you have, uh, the disk is massive and you form there a planetary system and, or even a companion there. And then those spirals and rings. Then I mentioned that jets are present in the young stellar objects. But they are not relativistic jets, but certainly magnetic field is present. And the magnetic field can be quite, uh, quite strong. Winds also are present. Dust opacities, they are very complex because they, there are many types of dust molecules, etc. There is something which is very important and known under the name of slow, snow line. Those disks are so cold that water can form ice. And that dramatically affects the dust uh, formation. So actually this is a, a picture, this is a theoretical picture, we do not see those details. But at least there are theoretical and spectroscopic suggestions that uh, if you have uh, the temperature low enough that you have icy grains, those icy grains are large. They also get mixed with uh, other grains, but they, they, they grow very rapidly and the content here is like the interior of, of the comet nowadays. So it's mostly icy with some dirt, dirty ice balls. And they are growing. On the other hand, closer to the star when ice is not present, usually fragmentation is more efficient than coagulation. So if you want to form planets, you have to do it here, above the slow line. The problem is that the snow line is quite far from the star. Now when you see planets, they are frequently much closer than you would think the slow line, snow line allows for, for that. Particularly hot Jupiters. So then you have additional 
uh, problem that you have to form planets, including called, called Jupiter or whatever. And then those ready planets have to drift in because small things cannot drift, they will be destroyed. So the physics behind is very complicated. People try to, 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 to calculate how this uh, coagulation proceeds, but it's not, it's not simple. Like I, I, I guarantee you, it's not simple. So finally, you have formation of, of larger bodies from time to time. And then if this larger body forms, it opens a gap. So then it may prevent formation of the next bodies. Whole dynamics becomes very complicated. Usually people start study either the dynamics or how, how to open those gaps, or then whether through the gap you can have some inflow or not. I think recent mm, mm, MHD simulation suggests that even if you open a gap, you can have some accretion, some streams joining the, 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 the rings between uh, gaps very complicated. So then you, you need this drifting, which I already uh, mentioned, the drifting of, of newly formed planets toward the center. And then if you think about accretion mechanics in the disk, there is one more uh, problem. I told you that we need this efficient viscosity to, to create a high accretion rate. And that this efficient viscosity is provided by magnetorotational instability. We had a whole, almost whole lecture on that. The problem is that in those disks, you have parts which are dense and cold enough that there are arguments, magnetorotational instability cannot work there. So how to go around it? This is some kind of uh, suggestion and people do some simulations, uh, MHD simulations. Of course, if you do MHD simulations, you don't do this, right? One thing at a time, nobody does the whole picture. But when he, when he does Armitage, he is one of the, of the experts in simulations. He, he sees some kind of uh, dead zone and then in order to, 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 to power the, the whole disk, he needs to irradiate the, this dead zone from outside by the newly formed star, not, yet, not quite ready, but newly formed, with uh, perhaps generating jet, x-rays, whatever. If you irradiate, then you ionize the surface of this dead zone. And then again, your MRI is back into operation. So the accretion flow, flow proceeds here and then, then here <coughs> on the top. And this is a dead zone. And then it's not obvious what happens in this dead zone because in those simulations, you do not have this physics, right? Still many things to, to do here and to solve. Uh, shouldn't we see those uh, structures there even though they are optically thin? Yeah, well, but, but what do you see is this, right? Yes. It seems like it's tight, disjoint at some point. And uh, here it suggests that it should be some connection which might be optically thin. But here you do not see, you cannot resolve the, 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 the planet here, the gap, you do not see the stream. And then you do not see whether this, uh, which part is active or, or, or uh, passive. From the spectra, you can estimate the accretion rate, but you don't know whether you have a dead zone which does not accrete or not. You see the surface. And is it like a continuous section? Like, because I, as I understand, it's a cut and it's just a patch being shown. So it's like a- Because they do only the, 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 this part of in simulations. They cannot do more. So they, 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 they cut some small part and they neglect all this physics. I have some opacities, but not much. They just check MRI and those people, they, they do not bother uh, uh, MRI. They use some kind of uh, drifting. They do not even use viscosity. 
It's not globally solved, it's far too complicated. So of course we have uh, hopes for, for better data and people who are involved in, in planning uh, uh, SPICA infrared mission uh, at Copernicus Center uh, Richard Sterba is, is involved in this project, for example. They expect to have a satellite which will be able to measure uh, very accurately with high resolution all the infrared spectra from such systems. And this is the, the, the plot which I, I, I borrowed from their uh, planned mission. You see how, how much physics they expect. So they, they have here a star, here gazol streams, here uh, just inner disk, here I don't know why this is so fast, but this is, ICs are here, this is CO and this is CO but other multiplets and this is, I don't know, some, and this is water but not ices. And maybe if we really see all those spectral features, then from the emission lines, from all those molecules, we will get the dynamics. But theoretically, it's too difficult. We need this data. So it's really complicated. Okay, symbiotic stars. I will mention that because this is uh, uh, also a speciality at Copernicus uh, Center. Uh, Joanna Mikolajewska uh, is, is busy with uh, symbiotic stars. And additionally, recently they are considered <coughs> as, as interesting because they might be, or at least, uh, might be progenitors of some supernovae 1a because there are problems with progenitors of supernovae 1a but it's not obvious whether they will work or they will not anyway spectroscopically they are known since a long time uh, they when when their binary nature was not known they already looked uh, very strange from the spectroscopical point of view because they contain both absorption lines which are characteristic for uh, typical main sequence stars and they contain also emission lines uh, characteristic for bright nebulae. So this, this, uh, this class was already commented uh, as a special class by Annie uh, Cannon. She lived many years ago and over more than one century ago, she, she proposed this uh, star classification, which we are still using like A, B, O, whatever. So she, she did not include those symbiotic stars in, in her classification because they didn't look like anything reasonable. Now, of course, we, we, we know that uh, those are binary stars and they basically con consist of evolved uh, giants and a more com compact companion. Mm. It could be a white dwarf. Most of the time it is white dwarf. Occasionally it can be neutron star or even a main sequence star in some sources, maybe. So this is an artistic if you know that we have uh, is donor star and then this more compact star, they can have a jet, they frequently have jet, they accrete through the inner Lagrange uh, point. This is the example of the spectrum. So indeed you see, it does not look like a typical spectrum. This is the absorption feature, stellar absorption feature. And this is strong narrow emission line like in HEN, for example. Why they are interesting from our point of view? 
they may have discs, although it's not clear that all of them have, have, have the... Some of them show a significant outbursts. This is uh, one of the symbiotic uh, stars. And this is uh, B magnitude. So you see they, they show outbursts by more or less two, two magnitudes. Not very regular, but something is uh, happening. The nature of this outburst is not clear. It's still under discussion and there are two schools. Some people suggest it may be ionization instability and accretion disk, as we shortly discussed during previous lectures and we will discuss soon now in the context of cataclysmic variables. On the other hand, it may be also unstable burning on the companion. And this is not, not clear because the pattern is not uh, really regular. Maybe it's uh, a combination of both, actually. So now we will concentrate on cataclysmic variables, which are indeed also a speciality at Copernicus Center. And uh, Joe Smack is the, the leading person in in this uh, topic and uh, they are frequently considered as the best laboratory for accretion disks because we have uh, a relatively good access we are marginally resolving some disks not directly but we are they have several advantages but of course nothing is always very very simple what are those cataclysmic uh, variables? So they always consist of a main sequence donor star, which fills the Roche lobe, and then through this inner Lagrange point, the material flows towards the central white dwarf. This is the general property and practically the definition of the cataclysmic variable. Sometimes you have uh, an accretion, you have a stream and then you have a bright spot, you have an accretion disk, you have a boundary layer. Not always. First, the central star, the, the white dwarf, can have large magnetic fields. It does not always have large magnetic field, but it can have large magnetic field. And from this point of view, all cataclysmic variables are divided into uh, three types. Polars, or AM Hercules stars, intermediate polars, and other. So polars are characterized by very strong magnetic field of the white dwarf. The magnetic field is so strong that the magnetosphere prevents the accretion disk formation. Just the pressure from the magnetosphere is strong enough to, 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 to stop. So the stream hits the outer part of the, of the magnetosphere and then it's redirected and then flows on the white dwarf through the accretion column. We talked about accretion column. So there is no disk in this case. In the case of intermediate polars, as you can guess, and they are also known as the, the Q Hercules type of stars, the field, magnetic field is not so strong. So the disk forms, you have this uh, stream, you have a hot spot or subsequently a bulge in the disk, you have a disk, but then close to the uh, star, the disk is again disrupted, and then you start to have accretion column here. So you have part, so you have part of, the, of the disk, but not whole, the, whole disk. And of course, in the case of other or Eugeminorum type stars, then you have what I showed to you before. 
Then the magnetic field is really faint. The accretion disk touches the star. And then you have also the boundary layer. I talked about it that in the boundary layer, the amount of energy dissipated is twice or in GR, but in, in, in here we are not, we don't need GR. It's equal to the uh, rest of the, of the uh, flux emitted in accretion disk. So this boundary layer is bright. So you see, this is one of the complications in the disk and it's usually uh, happily ignored in all the theory. But th this is not the end of classification, right? We have to first classify things and then we can concentrate on those disks. Uh, cataclysmic variables are named cataclysmic because they undergo eruptions, right? Cataclysms. So from the point of view of variability, they are divided into several types. Classical novi, recurrent novi, nova-like and dwarf novi. This is an example of the, of the light curve of uh, classical nova. So you see that the luminosity went up. We don't even know the lower value, but it's by several orders of magnitude, formal values. Seven to 11 magnitude. Sometimes it's not really, in the past it was not measured because the star was not observed. Nowadays it's usually better you can get that. So classical novae are less bright than supernovae. The, the total energy budget is estimated to be 10 to 44, 10 to 46 ergs integrated budget. While for the supernovae and hypernovae, we have 10 to 41, not visible to 10 to uh, 51 to 53. So few, several orders of magnitude. Uh, higher. Kilonovi, which I mentioned during the previous lecture, of course, they are kind of in between because they are one factor 1000 brighter than, 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 than uh, classical novi. So the time scale is uh, relatively short. This is really quite short and well resolved. But then this tail continues for a couple of years. So we classify source as a classical nova if we have one such outburst in the system. So it's an observational classification. Uh, we see what, what happened because if we, oops, back, if we wait a few years, we can now make a map of the system and you see that the envelope is expanding. So this was done with, uh, in the infrared uh, for the, the Hercules uh, star using uh, space William Herschel telescope. So you see it's really ejection. You, there are no doubts about it. Envelope of the, of the white dwarf is ejected. So what, what happens? We know what happens because the, we have this inflow of the material onto the surface of the white dwarf. This is this white dwarf. And here we have the generate stellar core of the white dwarf. And now hydrogen envelope forms through the accretion. So if we start now, then the, the, the hydrogen envelope is thin, but it accumulates, accumulates, accumulates. And then at the bottom of the zone, finally the temperature and the pressure rise considerably and thermonuclear reaction starts. And this leads to outburst, to rapid outburst because the, the core is degenerate. 
and why this outburst is so spectacular. During the lecture one, we estimated the efficiency of various processes. The efficiency of accretion on the white dwarf is not really spectacular. It's, it's uh, 10 to minus 5, a few times 10 to minus 5. The efficiency of, of hydrogen burning is much higher. So you have an accretion, but now you dissipate it much more energy than it was related to, to, to the accretion process. So you generate more energy than the binding energy, gravitational binding. You unbound easily all the material which was accreted. So you can eject all this material or actually even a bit more. So ejection, so this, this nova outburst does not happen very, very frequently, but it, the frequency depends on the accretion rate, because if you, uh, it, it, you require the, the, the envelope mass to get an outburst, but then the formation of the proper mass depends on accretion rate. The higher accretion rate, the more, the, 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 the faster you, you create the, the requested envelope mass. So if you have higher accretion rate, outbursts will be uh, uh, much more frequent. So in, in some systems, we observe two or even more uh, nova outbursts, and then we classify them obviously as recurrent novae. On the other hand, in some systems, um, outbursts are so unfrequent that we were not lucky and we didn't see any. But otherwise, the, the system spectroscopically looks like uh, uh, any other system uh, several years after the outburst. And then this is classified as novella. But we expect that this outburst will, will take place. Perhaps at some special circumstances, but that's not quite clear, the nuclear burning can be steady. But it's not simple because, you know, nuclear burning leads to dissipation of, of considerable energy. And then if you don't want to, 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 to uh, have an ejection outburst, then you have to transfer this energy to the core efficiently. You have to cool the, 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 the zone. So this is, this is really under, under discussion. One more comment which I should make to the previous uh, case. It's not obvious uh, as a result whether the black hole, the, 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 the white dwarf mass uh, increases or decreases as in the course of evolution. Because if you eject more mass than you accrete it, the, the white dwarf mass actually decreases. And then if it decreases, then you will never cross the Chandrasekhar mass. And if you never cross the Chandrasekhar mass, you cannot expect supernova 1a eruption. And this is the problem behind. But now I mentioned that there is one more class, which is known as dwarf novi outbursts. And this is something which is absolutely unrelated to thermonuclear flashes, which should happen also in those systems, but this is not what what we know, know in, in those systems. In those systems, we see very frequent outbursts every, I don't know, several weeks, whatever. They are pretty regular, although they are not quite identical. They are much, much less bright orders of magnitude, less bright than Novi eruption. So it, for years, there were the discussions uh, whether the, uh, this, uh, those eruptions are caused by instabilities in the outflow transfer from the companion through L1 or accretion disk instabilities. Finally, uh, we now settled, starting from papers by Meyer and Meyer Hofmeister and, and Joe Smart, that this is ionization instability. Actually, Joe Smart proposed this 
scenario at the same time and independently from Myers. But he sent his publication at the same year as Myers and his paper was not published. I don't remember whether it was uh, rejected or delayed or whatever. It was one, one short pub paper was only published a year later elsewhere, not in the original journal. And then uh, a few years later, uh, much more extensive uh, paper, which, but he's considered also as called discoverer of, of the me uh, mechanism uh, uh, responsible for dwarf novi uh, outbursts. So it's now generally believed that this is really ionization instability, which I shortly mentioned uh, before. So you, you saw this, this plot in, uh, uh, during lecture nine that was made for, for AGN, but uh, does not matter. And here was the surface density and here it was an accretion rate. And this is the curve which shows the thermal equilibrium in that case at 10 Schwarzschild radii because it was for an AGN. And if you remember, you had here slim disk, you had radiation pressure instability. And then here, we have ionization instability. Of course, at 10 Schwarzschild ready, this uh, corresponds to, 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 to stupidly low uh, accretion rate. But now, if we study cataclysmic variables, we are not at 10 Schwarzschild ready, which are, we are at 8,000 Schwarzschild ready and more, because why the dwarf is huge, right? It, it cuts, in a sense, the inner radius, and then the whole diagram goes up significantly. So then in cataclysmic variables, you never are in this range, because that would mean super on accretion, but you are in that range, and you have this kind of instability. So you have the same limit cycle we are talking about. So first we have low stable branch and then rapid thermal jump to upper stable branch and then again and again and then you have a limit cycle which is re responsible for for outbursts so this kind of mechanism well explains the, the observed behavior of the hot spot because uh, uh, during the outburst the accretion disk expands because the accretion rate rises in the innermost part of the disk and this leads to extra expansion as we, we discussed when I discussed the global uh, uh, evolution of an accretion disk. And also it explains why some systems actually do not show dwarf novi outbursts. If they have higher accretion rates they are just stable. This is uh, a diagram which shows the orbital period and accretion rate anyway. This is the theoretical uh, criterion which corresponds to the request that the whole disk is always at the outer branch. Hold this even in the outer part. So then there is no instability. All disk is, is, is there. And you see this criterion is working very well. Those black points are systems which show novi outbursts and red systems never show novi outbursts, dwarf novi outbursts. So this is additional argument that uh, this, this uh, uh, instability is indeed uh, working. On the other hand, it's not uh, as simple as uh, modeling this disk is not as simple as you might think. Well, solving equations is not very difficult. Uh, this kind of equation, you have to solve two uh, uh, equations if you use uh, kind of one plus one approximation, and this is what is usually done. So separate, you calculate the vertical structure of the disk and separate, you solve for the radial, the independent radial structure using the surface density and uh, 
for example, effective uh, temperature. So it's not 2D computations, one plus one, but it's very fast and done by, by many uh, people. Uh, and if you don't do MRI, because this is fast global model, you have to use alpha viscosity prescription. And that's the first uh, problem. Single alpha viscosity does not work because the outbursts are of a much too low amplitude. Because if you plot this, oops, uh, if you plot this instability curve for a fixed viscosity, <laughs> the, the loop here is small. To get large outbursts, you need larger loop. So then if you look, for example, at two options, viscosity 0.1 and viscosity 0.02, and then you will say that on the hot branch, you have this viscosity, and on the low branch, you have this viscosity, then you create a nice loop. So for example, uh, Omeri in 80, 1980 uh, used kind of bridging formula, which which uh, does this thing. And then, of course, you can calculate the, the total outburst using one plus one uh, approximation. The next bad thing in those computations is that somehow they do depend on the radial grid. This is an example of outbursts. Very, it looks very nice. You even see a different outbursts, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. <coughs> but this picture of the high grid, high density grid, radial grid, and low density radial grid are different. Actually, that looks better than that one. And if you talk to Joe Smack, you will you can hear an argument why less dense grid is better. Because if you if you cheat on, on the vertical structure, then you shouldn't slice the disc like this, like, like a ham in the shop, right? It, when you cheat, the parcels, radial parcels, should be of the same order as the disc thickness, because that kind of makes sense to do approximation. So that looks better. But, but that guy, Omeri, he claims this is better. Whatever. So why nevertheless people claim that the cataclysmic variables are absolutely the best for modeling accretion disks? Well, First, there is only a small dynamical range of radius which you have to use. Because I told you the in inner radius is at uh, 8,000 Schwarzschild radii and the outer radius is more or less 100 times larger. So you don't need to resolve uh, uh, innermost uh, part of the disk in, uh, around a no neutron star. That is much more difficult because you have large dynamical range of uh, Keplerian velocities and dynamical speed. So this is the basic advantage. Then this boundary layer. In most cases, it seems like this boundary layer is optically thin and actually emits in X-rays. So if you concentrate on optical emission, you can say, oh, well, there is no boundary layer. On the other hand, those X-rays do irradiate the disk. So sometimes it is included, sometimes not. And then additionally, mm, you cannot fully resolve those disks like in the case of pre-main sequence stars. But in eclipsing sources, you can do some kind of mapping. You formally uh, divide the disk into several parts. And then during the eclipse, uh, uh, those parts are visible with certain weight, which is uh, considered uh, from, from, from geometry. And then you observe uh, spectra at various uh, stages, and then you can deconvolve everything, and you can 
do this mapping. And in this case, uh, this, this is also the way how it was shown that during the outburst, uh, the temperature in the disk is uh, consistent with standard stationary Keplerian mm -hmm. motion. And I think I showed this, this plot uh, during previous lecture, so I will not repeat this uh, plot. Uh, but because people are so enthusiastic about this uh, this modeling, they they really put uh, considerable effort. But as usually, either you do the shilling box carefully, or you have a global model, but then you don't do everything properly. So what was recently uh, noticeable? It's a paper by Coleman, but all, all the other guys. Uh, experts in this kind of simulation. They did image the <coughs> simulation, shearing box approximation, that's true. But you know, it was kind of annoying that you have to guess and modify this viscosity parameter. So they decide if you do MHD, you do not put viscosity by hand, you derive viscosity. And that was a considerable step forward. <laughs> and then they derived viscosity as a function of uh, effective temperature from the simulations. And they were able also to reproduce this plot, sigma versus effective temperature. And this was really consistent with the viscosity changing from much lower value here, 0.02 to much higher value 0.13 here. This is what was guessed before, but now MRI really returns that. Why it happens? You see here the disk becomes uh, quite cold and this is ionization instability, right? So here the disk is ionized and here the disk becomes neutral. If the disk becomes neutral, then the magnetic field is not so well coupled to plasma or plasma is not so well coupled to the magnetic field. MRI slightly dies, not completely, like in the previous uh, systems of pre-main sequence stars. There in some places it dies completely. Here it does not die completely, but the efficiency of MRI drops. And that was recently indeed recovered in simulations. I think that's, that's quite interesting. I'm not sure whether they, 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 they cheated in the meantime, but I, I hope it's, uh, it's okay. I, I don't know what they assumed about the geometry of the, of the magnetic field in simulations. So, you know, what is the time scale of this jump of the viscosities? Is it like same uh, contained with the other? They stage? do not, uh, well, they, do not do the global simulation. They do not reproduce the limit cycle. Now, those are each of those po uh, points come from a separate uh, MRI run. They cannot do the global simulation, not in shearing box approximation. And then, you know, the time scale is, is much, much longer because when, when you do this kind of, uh, uh, when you do this kind of modeling, you assume that the disk is hydrostat in hydrostatic equilibrium and you calculate thermal and viscous evolution, which is thousands times longer. And when they do MRI, they can calculate 100 dynamical time scales, so they barely touch thermal time scale and not viscose. So they they cannot do their limit cycle, but still, I think it's it, it's quite interesting to 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 to, to see that indeed. But there are also other problems. And the most serious problem, which is here, but it will repeat itself also in X-ray binaries and in AGN. 
and that is the low accretion rate part, the square sense. First, observationally, you cannot, you can see something, but you cannot solve all those problems. So here you have observational uh, data for system Eugeninorum by Paula Schkold, not recent, but anyway, quite nice. So in the optical band, uh, you see the outer ring, and you see this is a ring of the material because the, 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 the lines are, are spread. It's not like in HGL, right? So it's a narrow ring. On the other hand, in, inside, you obviously have hot material because this is the, the, the Chandra data and you have very highly ionized iron. So it's low density plasma with the temperature 10 to 7 or whatever, 10 to 6, 10 to 7. A bit even more because well, it's, this is Iron 25, so you need even more, few times 10 to 7 Kelly. So you have this uh, hard X-rays inside. On the other hand, you don't have the inner cold disc because this, this line is, is, is too obviously double peaked. So this quiescent state is, is a, a kind of a problem. And the next problem, which Joe Smack always stressed, but he didn't solve this problem fully, is that if you do modeling how the outburst uh, happens, here you have also uh, again this Omeri, this guy. At the beginning, before outburst, the accretion rate rises, right? Rises, then outburst. Drops, rises, outburst. Why it happens? Oops, uh, sorry, again. This is related to this picture. Because after the outburst, you, you cool the disc, you jump to point A, and then you move along the stable lower branch from A to B. B is higher. So the accretion rate is slowly rising, right? This is what you see in the model. But this is what you see in the data. I found this data by pure accident. I'm not sure how reliable is actually this picture and all parts of this picture, but some parts are certainly uh, reliable because uh, they are published in, uh, in the paper by Barclays et al. 2012. Uh, Kepler satellite, who was uh, built to discover extrasolar planets by pure accident, uh, catched uh, a few uh, dwarf novae and then the measurement is not like by amateurs, whatever. This is really professional measurement every 30 seconds because this is what the Kepler does, observe the field of view every 30 seconds. So you see here, this is one of those new uh, dwarf novi uh, outbursts. And before the outburst, there is no rise. Here, it, this is absolutely flat. There is maybe some rise later, but here it's still drop. So this is certainly reliable. And then those outbursts also were like published here. What I have uh, doubts about is this. Here, they show the expanded version of the light curve and they claim somehow without any comment because this is just zoo universe, whatever page. 
I would be really happy to, to trace this thing, but I, 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 I didn't. It looks like a very regular oscillation. Here they show the expansion of that part, and that looks like the red noise more than anything else. And I talked to you about red noise, and uh, flickering is also present, and this kind of red noise in, in cataclysmic variables, and uh, it was always known to be, to be there. But this looks too, too regular, almost impossible. Then, apart from the uh, regular normal outburst, you have a super outburst that uh, happens quite frequently in, in cataclysmic variables. And during this super outburst, you have additional regular structure. This is also well known, not from this data, generally well known as uh, super high. So there is nothing like this rise before the outburst. So the disk does not reveal itself. It remains optically thin. But somehow has to accumulate in the outer ring and then start the outburst. But this is not quite like in this, uh, in this picture, right? So somehow this lower branch should be kind of flat. Nobody produced that observation, uh, I mean, theoretically. It has to be still done. Then additionally, uh, indeed, uh, the theory should explain the super outbursts which are happening from, from time to time. So some, some qualitative uh, or partially quantitative uh, idea how, how to produce optically thin part of the disk was uh, proposed by Meyer and Meyer Hofmeister in 1994, and that the same applies to, to AGNs and galactic sources. Yeah. But that requires additional uh, introduction of the additional uh, structure. If you have a cool disk, then you cannot argue that the disk evaporates all of a sudden because there are no physical mechanisms to, 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 to lead to that. On the other hand, if you say that from the beginning the disk had a hot uh, corona, hot corona flow, then if you in include the interaction between the hot corona and the disk, if the disk has low surface uh, density and the coronal flow is large, then the electron conduction can lead to evaporation of the disk. And then indeed you can reproduce the inner hot flow, inner ADAP, IRAP, or whatever you, you call it, that was in the context of AGN, it's more popular. But in, it actually was first proposed in, in, for cataclysmic variables and later with, with Agatha Ruzhańska, we modified that for, for galactic uh, systems. But it's not that we have a global model fully describing this part. We still need it. Because we, we have to first create this corona, right? And this corona depends on the global magnetic field and global magnetic field depends on the assumptions. And we had a whole lecture about magnetic field that we know how it's complicated. So then, then we have to trigger the outburst somehow in the outer ring which is not part of the standard model. As for super humps and super outbursts, that seems to be solved due to the Kepler data. Somehow, uh, finally, it is almost like a, a step back because at the beginning I told you that uh, dwarf novi eruptions were discussed as uh, uh, either 
alteration disk instabilities or transfer, mass transfer instability. And now it's generally, I think, acknowledged that super outbursts are actually uh, mass transfer instabilities. And they are probably related to, uh, as was first uh, suggested, to some resonances in between the outer disk and the orbital period. I'm not yet sure how it's working, but it's uh, somehow supported by uh, recent uh, observations based on, on, on Kepler data. And it looks reasonable because inside the disk you don't have more material, I guess. So, and then probably they have some arguments based on the hotspot because hotspots should react in a different way if you have large mass transfer. But I didn't check with those papers if they really paid close attention to hotspot. If you are interested, ask Joe Smack. He prob probably follows this kind of uh, development. So this is more or less what all what I uh, prepared. So you see uh, cataclysmic uh, accretion disks in, in, in uh, dwarf novi systems are simple, but not that simple. On the other hand, if you compare with pre-main sequence stars, yes, they are simple. And this is the homework, which I suggest. I, I, I told you that during the, the, the outbursts, the, the outer radius expands, but I would like you to, to comment on that a bit. So that is all for today. Next lecture will be about uh, galactic uh, binaries, I mean, accretion onto neutron stars or, or stellar mass uh, black holes. Next week. Okay, questions to that part. No, everything is clear or everything is, is depressing. Well, it is quite complicated, particularly those problems related to, 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 to planet formation. But there is a lot of progress there as well. But there are many loose ends. Okay, if no questions, then thank you.